was Arborea in a nutshell. Prior to that visual journey, you might have thought of Arborea like this. To be honest, it's kind of both. I mean, this is a new take on worker placement in my mind, kind of taking worker placement to a totally different level. And at the same time, it's also a psychedelic theme that is counter to any Euro that I've ever played. And it all starts with this. This is your villager, one of three different types that you as the patron saint of this village will lead on journeys, presumably after they eat lots of magic mushrooms. Just kidding. This game in no way implies drug use whatsoever. It just kind of makes you feel like you took some. Anyways, where was I? It's leading your village on a mission to repair biomes and repopulate them with animals after some cataclysmic event. And how do you do this? Of course, it's worker placement. However, that worker placement has you asking some different questions, not just what do I need when I place the worker, but when do I need it? So you start with a couple meeples, you place one on your turn. You can also pay an in-game currency called spirit that allows you to place more. So the interesting part about this worker placement is you're placing these spirits on a track that is mobile. The track moves. You have an opportunity at the beginning of your turn to move the track, as I had said before. You also, at the end of your turn, move all the tracks that you have spirits on. Now, the really cool thing is every time that track moves, even by another player, you have the opportunity to jump off the track and go on your journey. And you definitely want to jump off because there's things on these journeys that you need to complete other things in the game, which we'll talk about in just a second. And this is the part of the story where we start to talk a little bit about analysis paralysis. It starts to get a little more complicated. In fact, if you have enough of your workers on the board, deciding when to jump off can completely be mind boggling. Just know on all of these sprawling paths, there are symbols connected to things that you need in the game at one point or another. And instead of going through and defining what each of these symbols means, I thought it might be helpful to go through my decision tree as I begin a game and start to place my spirits out on the board. The first question I ask myself is, do I have ecosystem cards to complete? You start the game with one ecosystem card already out and completed. However, you don't have any already sitting on the top of your board, essentially kind of guiding what you want to do. So if that's the case, I go down this path right here and I collect ecosystem cards. However, if I do have ecosystem cards sitting at the top of my board, I take a look at the symbols on them. Those symbols right there are exactly what I need to complete this card. So I look over at the shared resource tracker and see if there's enough there for me to complete the card. Yes, I said shared resource tracker. No, this is not the game's version of a hippie commune. Let's take a quick side quest to explain what this shared resource tracker actually does because in my mind, it's absolutely brilliant. And one of the reasons I really, really like this game. So there's five resources and there's one wild resource. All of these resources are represented on the board on these paths. And as your spirits go down the path, they collect the resources. In basically any other game, you'd get these cute little wooden bits and you'd start collecting them and hoarding them and, and feeling really good about yourself at your, your piles of riches sitting in front of you. And here, it's absolutely not the case. See, when you collect these resources, you take the top part of this tracker and move it up the track equal to the number of resources you collected. Now, in your turn, you now have the opportunity to complete one of your cards on your board, and you might do so and, and use all of the resources, and, and that's great. However, you might not be able to actually complete your ecosystem card, or you don't use everything. And in that instance, the bottom part of that resource marker slides up, and for every point value it goes past, you collect it. So there is a big benefit to collecting resources and not actually using them. And you'll notice on the board, there's variable numbers related to all of these different points and levels in which these resources are, the water being some of the most expensive. You can actually collect a really good amount of points. However, the downside is you need those resources to complete these ecosystem cards, 
which we'll get into the importance in just a little bit, but just know it feels really, really bad when you are starting to stack these resources on a shared tracker, only to have another player go and take those resources from you. It does sting a little bit less because you would have just collected points for producing those resources for somebody else. I can't emphasize enough on how great the friction is here that is created in the game when you're sitting there sweating, trying to get enough resources to play your card, seeing that another opponent has a card that they need to fulfill with those same exact resources. And if you're coming up one or two short, oh, it feels so bad because they're gonna go ahead and take those resources and complete their card. On the flip side, it feels awfully good if you're on the other side, side of that table and you're the one using the resources that they just produced. You know, it is the way it is. I mean, one viable strategy, especially near the end of the game, is to go down paths and just collect resources, not use them and just get the points. Other games will give you an inconsequential number of points at the end of a game for leftover resources. And I never really liked that just because it felt like you're getting a consolation prize for inefficiency. In this instance, it makes the collection of resources in an actual strategic move and it just feels better, especially because those points can be so big. All right, back to our regular scheduled program here. You have an ecosystem card. You are looking at the resources and they're not there for you. So you simply place a villager on a path that will get you those resources. All right, so now you have your ecosystem card there ready to populate. Let's talk a little bit about what you populate it with and it's animals. Now, each color in your ecosystem wants to have a different animal there. So if you're sitting there and you have a, a bunch of pink squares, you want to, what is it called? Something frog. All these animals have really interesting names. I think it's just been an example. Ah, okay. You have a mush frog and it wants to be in these pink ecosystem tiles and you have to place them at an intersection and the more of those pinks that are around it give you more points. It's this kind of uh, multiplication effect and it's part of the strategy in putting those ecosystem cards together. Um, some rules around the ecosystem cards as you put them down, by the way, they just can't ever fully cover another ecosystem card, but you can cover different spaces to kind of make your animal placements more efficient. Anyways, that's a little side quest there, but back to the main quest, which is I need that mush frog. However, I look up in the borderlands at the top of the board and there's no mush frogs. So then I have to direct my attention back to the board and I try to find the little mush frog symbol. Ah, there it is. So I need to go on this track and I need my spirit to wait to get to that point. And then I jump off and go collect the mush frog. However, I don't collect the mush frog. I invite it into the borderlands and then I get a bonus for it actually being placed. So it still feels okay, but it's another one of those friction points that another player could go and steal that mush frog from you. Whew. So how do I get the mush frog now? I see the mush frog at the top. I've gone down the path. I've, I've, I've invited the mush frog into the borderlands. It's there. I have my ecosystem card ready to place the mush frog now I have to go find this symbol and then go down this path and once I make it down this path I can actually go and grab an animal and when I do I get a little spirit bonus as I grab the animal but then I can place it on my board ready to put it in my ecosystem near the end of my turn Whew, that's a lot okay so that's the majority of the game however there's some big parts on this board that are still sitting there that we have not talked about at all First and foremost, you see these other creatures all around the board. They're actually sages that you are trying to gift. The downfall is, is when you gift them, you actually don't get anything. In fact, nothing at all. And really, you your payment comes later when you go down these tracks and you activate this symbol. This symbol right here is what tells you you can now go to that sage and collect gifts. Depending on the number of gifts you've given them, they will give the same number of gifts back. So you're investing in an action track essentially and there's some really powerful things there that will totally make other action tracks irrelevant like going down this one here is the only place to actually go get animals or creatures into your ecosystem however if you go down this one and activate that particular sage you get to pick an animal you can see how that investment over time makes you more and more powerful as the game goes on 
and we've noticed it's really easy to overlook these sages and where you're placing the cubes and in some cases you don't have a choice in fact the ecosystem cards in a lot of instances are rewarding you with a gift to a very specific sage so that might weigh a little bit in what ecosystem cards you're choosing in the first place to try to complete and the last consideration here is not really a main consideration as to which track you go on. It's when you go on it. You see these symbols on the tracks, they're related to the special goals that are scored at the end of the game. And the higher you go up on each of these tracks is the bigger multiplier that you'll get. Each one of these have a maximum of 48 points you can actually score. So they are huge. In fact, if you focus on going up those tracks, a lot and make sure that that particular goal is one you're kind of maximizing which isn't really hard to do they could really change the game and this is something in the first couple plays we kind of totally didn't pay attention to uh, and in fact in those first couple plays we were scoring them wrong we weren't capping kind of your baseline score at eight um, there's some instances where you can score technically way above that but just know if your scores are uh, through the roof make sure you're scoring uh, these seasons or goals in the right way and this brings me to my only real criticism of this game's design and it's really these season tracks while they're very fun to score they produce so many points and it's really easy to run away with a game if you're getting lucky on your turn to have the that symbol constantly coming up because there's only four of them and that track is constantly moving. There's a likeliness that each time it's your turn to place one of your spirits, those symbols are not available at all. So we found that you can go through a game feeling pretty close, your ecosystems look pretty equal, but at the end of the day, once you score some of these goals, if somebody's gone really high on one of those tracks and has a time six multiplier on an eight point base and they get that full amount and you were sitting at the two times, you're going to lose. So a very, what seems to be a small overlooking of a detail in the game, it can be completely catastrophic. Now that we kind of fully understand that and we're really paying attention to that from the beginning, it's a little bit easier to stay closer, but in those early plays that can lead to some really swingy scores and giant gaps at the end of the game. In the end, I think this design is honestly spectacular. And I think most of the reviews I've seen are fairly similar. I'm honestly surprised that this didn't spend more time on the hotness. I was expecting this to have a really big boost when it came out. Dice Tower gave it wonderful reviews and I thought that would also carry it there. I don't know why this hasn't been embraced like some other games. And that is why I really wanted to do this review. I wanted to scream from the rooftops that this design is elegant and novel. This is a totally different way of doing worker placement. There's friction on the resources and whether you can use them or not. There's friction on bringing the animals into the borderland and whether you can get them on your board before the other opponent actually takes them from you. It uses time as a mechanism and, you know, resource management on whether you want to speed up time essentially and, and get those tracks accelerated to get your spirit off and get the stuff at the right time. It really, more so than other games, has you thinking ahead a couple turns. You really have to, because if you're not getting the resources at the right time and the ecosystem cards at the right time and you're able to play them, your opponents are going to run all over you. They're going to take the ecosystem card that you wanted. They're going to use the resources that you needed to use, or they're gonna grab the creature that you really needed to populate your ecosystem with. So that constant friction in this game just makes it so engaging and is actually fairly interactive for a Euro. Danny Garcia is the designer here, and I am becoming an incredible fan. Um, Barcelona was another one um, from Board and Dice that I absolutely loved. They used a grid-based activation on a on worker placement, and I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And then I play this, and this is just something totally different. You know, some designers you can see like, oh, that element came from these other designs. I don't see really any Barcelona in here other than it is a novel take on worker placement. So hats off to you, Danny. I think this is a wonderful design, and I highly recommend worker placement connoisseurs play this game. Don't let the busy board or the, the psychedelic-like art 
throw you here. If you're a fan of mechanics, you gotta play this game. And this is absolutely staying in my collection and I do not foresee any other games coming along like it to replace it. And with that said, thanks for being here. I really appreciate you staying. If you've made it this far, maybe think about liking and subscribing. I don't know. And on that note, have a good day. See you next time.